Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. Today, we are going to be discussing yet another truly fantastic case of super high strangeness from, drumroll please, my favorite decade, the 1970s. Now, this event occurred in 1977, to be exact, on November the 7th at around 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, an interior decorator from Sandusky, Ohio, by the name of Millard Faber, was walking near Monroeville on the western branch of the Huron River. Apparently, as a supplemental income, he collected moss and algae to sell to local fish stores. And so that is exactly what he was doing on this fine day. Now, as he was moving through the densely wooded area, you know, just mining his own beeswax and looking for algae, all of a sudden he came upon a very odd sight. Referred to in Awareness magazine as the by now standard Sasquatch or Bigfoot creature, the thing that Faber saw stood upright at about eight feet tall, though he said that it walked with kind of a hunched or stooped posture and didn't have a neck. He claimed that it had incredibly long arms and was completely covered in dark hair, with the exception of the face, which was hairless and had glowing orange eyes. Now, apparently, as soon as this thing noticed that Faber noticed it, it jumped into the river and absolutely vanished. Now, although Faber was rather naturally um, pretty freaked out by his weird sighting, he wanted to find some trace evidence to show that he hadn't just imagined the whole thing, that there had actually been something there. So as he went in search of this evidence, he was, unfortunately for him, assailed by, you probably guessed it, an intensely putrid odor. Now, undeterred by the horrendous stench, he was able to locate huge footprints. He claimed that they were about 24 inches long by 18 inches wide. He also found a branch with a large claw mark in it. And this 7 by 10 foot clearing in the grass nearby. He said that it looked like it had been stomped down um, in this large 7 by 10 foot shape. Now, Faber did what he believed was the reasonable thing and immediately called both the sheriff departments and the newspapers from each of the adjoining counties. Shortly thereafter, he was joined by a deputy from each and a reporter from each, and they returned to the area. Now, although the creature had apparently vamoosed by this time, all but one deputy claimed that they could still smell this putrid odor permeating the area. As Faber kind of went through and began showing them the evidence, he actually came to believe that a cover-up was going on. Because, among other things, the deputy who claimed he couldn't smell anything also said that the clearing had been created by pot smokers and took it upon himself to pull down the clawed branch. So because Faber did genuinely believe that they were trying to cover up this sighting, he decided not to show them the large footprints. Now, as they continued looking through the area, you know, the whole time, this putrid odor just kind of hanging around, they found that where the water was kind of coming through this really dense patch of undergrowth, that was where the odor was absolutely unbearable. So quickly, the decision was made not to continue investigating further due to a lack of evidence, which is a little odd given that there really wasn't a lack of evidence. But again, whatever. So the Sandusky Register apparently did publish a very scant and incorrect article detailing the investigation. However, oddly enough, they didn't include any of the photographs which they had apparently taken at the time. Now, too, um, a day after the article was published, the woman who was investigating this case, a woman by the name of Vera Perry, claimed that six helicopters were spotted flying over the area. Now, a couple days later, there were even four more helicopters, which was apparently very uncommon for the area at that time. Now, as weird as all this is, remember that I said that this is a sighting and a half. Three days after... Faber's sighting of the strange glowing-eyed Sasquatch, he had a sighting of a very different sort. He had retired to bed for the evening when he claimed he felt as though something was in his room. So he looked towards the door and saw, well, it wasn't Bigfoot, I can tell you that. No, as a matter of fact, it was five glowing pink humanoids, which Faber claimed to see gliding into the room through the air towards him. He said that they stood about five feet tall and walked with a stoop. He compared it to almost like they were carrying some heavy object. He also claimed that they had bulbously large heads and glowing eyes, and that they wore skin diving suits with a belt. He also added this really odd detail. He said that even though they were gliding through the air towards him, they still moved their legs like they were walking, which is really weird. Also really weird is that for some bizarre reason, Faber happened to have four chairs by his bedside. So four of the entities took their seat, and the remaining one just kind of glided to within a foot of his bedside. So it was at this point that Faber claimed that he was impressed with the notion. And whether this was genuine telepathy, or kind of like in the Simonton and other encounters, where people say that they just happened to know, they could just somehow sense the message or the intent behind these entities, Faber claimed that he felt as though they were incredibly angry with him for going public with his Bigfoot sighting. 
he kind of said that it was almost like hatred and anger just kind of emanating from these entities. He also was impressed by the notion that they were going to take him with them. Now, wherever it is they're headed, I don't really know. Thinking that this must just be a terrible nightmare, I mean, first the man is startled by Bigfoot, then he's ridiculed by the police and the newspapers, now he's got these humanoids in his room, Faber clicked on the light, hoping that this was all just some sort of terrible nightmare. Unfortunately, the beings remained. It was at this point that Faber started yelling and swearing at them to get out of his room. And much like in the Trasco encounter, that is exactly what they did. So in a quote to Miss um, Vera Perry, he said that they hadn't bothered him since that time. Through the course of December 1977, Perry was in contact both with Millard and his brother Robert, and encouraged them to go back to the area of the initial sighting to see if they could find any more evidence or possibly cast the footprints if those remained. Unfortunately, Robert said that they had driven back to the site one late afternoon, and they just stopped near this bridge that spanned a little um, tributary of the river, when, you know, as they were enjoying the peace and tranquility, suddenly each was hit with this wave of just absolute anxiety. So they both decided just to get in the car and peel out of the area, and later on they admit to each other that they both felt as though they were being watched. Now, friends of the Favors claimed that they had visited the sighting area, you know, pretty near that time, and were actually driven away by deputies from, drumroll please, the Erie and Huron County Sheriff's Departments. You know, I guess they were really, really trying to crack down on those pot smokers. I will also add that in this area during that time, there were a good many UFO and other just simply bizarre sightings, which include a strange home-invading whirlpool-like light, a bedroom invader described as mushroom-like, and an anomalous stench of rotten eggs which just assailed homes. However, that is a matter for another video, as we definitely have enough to cover here. And we certainly do. The first thing I really want to get out of the way is the notion of a cover-up involving a Bigfoot sighting. Now, of course, you mentioned the word cover-up, and immediately it conjures up little green men and crashed saucers. However, um, this isn't the only case where people have seen a cryptid, um, especially Bigfoot, and then had very similar kind of cover-up vibes. And at this point in time, too, when Faber first brought up the notion that his experience was being covered up, it was simply the Bigfoot encounter. You know, true, by the time the helicopters move in, he had also had his bizarre humanoid bedroom invasion, but it was his initial dealings with the police at that local county level that initially gave him that vibe. So the initial Bigfoot encounter, too, is also a course of interest. I mean, again, we have that fantastic area of flattened grass, which to me is indicative of crop circles. We also have the fact that the creature's eyes were described as glowing or self-luminous in broad daylight, and the fact that it plunged into a river and disappeared. I would love to have more details on how exactly it disappeared. You know, was the water brackish? Um, did it splash away? Or was this almost kind of like Looney Tunes style, like it just dove into the water and was totally gone? So, and two, of course, yet again, we have a waterway in connection with this bizarre sighting. Now, although all that is weird enough, what really takes the cake in this case is the fact that Faber claimed to have a bedroom visitation immediately after spotting the Bigfoot-like creature. And he himself believed that these two events were absolutely connected. Now, of course, a lot of witnesses to cryptids claim that there's almost like this telepathic message given to them where the creature is expressing anger at being spotted and warns the witness from telling anyone about their experience. Uh, many witnesses have claimed feeling as though if they speak about it, the creature is going to come and get them. So the odd thing is that people can get this vibe while looking in the eyes of a wolfman as easily as they can coming from the lips of one of those ominous men in black. However, in this case, the really interesting thing is that it is, it's kind of like the bedroom invaders were some sort of follow-up force, just letting Faber know that they really, really, really didn't like what he did with the sighting. Now, the other exceedingly odd thing is that Faber described the posture of the Bigfoot as being identical to that of the bedroom invaders, this kind of stooped posture. You know, it almost makes you wonder if the question isn't, is Bigfoot a man in a suit? The question is, is Bigfoot a spaceman in a suit? Even though, of course, Faber did not necessarily connect these bedroom visitants with the UFO activity in the area. You know, I have to wonder as well, too, he described the Bigfoot as having the glowing orange eyes and the humanoids as glowing pink. That's not too far along the spectrum from each other. So, you know, yet again, we have another tie between these apparently different types of entities. Two, although Faber said that the things hadn't bothered him since he told them to get lost, both he and his brother had that notion of being watched and heightened anxiety when they returned to the area of his sighting. And yet again, I must bring up you know, you've got these anomalous entities which just glided into a man's home, right into his bedroom, took a seat, and then started harassing him and expressing intense anger and hatred. Yet they were just dissuaded by being told to get out of his room. You know, exactly like in the Trasco encounter, you just, it doesn't make sense how that exactly works. 
I will say, though, that this is in line with many traditions often involving occult-type entities, or even ghosts. People claim that if you just project, you know, your intention at them, say, leave me alone, they actually will. So it's really interesting that that seems to apply to this case as well, which we wouldn't necessarily term these entities classically occult. And as a final really weird little detail, we have the description which Faber gave of the entity's movement through his bedroom as still looking like they were walking even though they were gliding through the air. I'll mention here that a lot of classically termed UFO occupant encounters detail entities which kind of float through the air and people describe their motions as looking almost like swimming. Um, there are still more encounters where people say that it looks like they're walking around on invisible platforms. However, in this case especially, to me it correlates to what would classically be termed an absolutely different field of study, and that is spectrology. There are countless reports of ghosts which are either walking slightly above the floor or slightly in the floor. And of course, because we consider, you know, in more conventional ways of thinking, ghosts to be the spirits of the departed, people say, oh, well, the floor was six inches lower back in the day, and that's why they're walking with their legs just embedded in the floor. You know, or, you know, there was a door in that wall, which is why the ghost just walked through the wall. However, in this case especially, where we have the very same behavior, which is usually ascribed to ghosts, by these, you know, absolutely inhuman looking entities. I think this is just yet again um, more evidence for the fact that, you know, these anomalies, these entities, don't just live or unlive in the neat and tidy boxes that we give them. And all of this phenomena kind of bleeds one into the other. So if you enjoyed this episode on the not so standard Sandusky Sasquatch sighting, please like, and if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with whatever else I might possibly be doing on my website, justanothertinfoilhat.com, and for exclusive content, make sure to check out my Patreon page, which is also listed under Just Another Tinfoil Hat. For today, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Do we?